Hello, and welcome to Art Show. I'm Craig Stover. Today, I have with me Stuart Netsky. Hey, Stuart, how are you? Good, Craig. How are you? Great. Great to have you on the show. Uh, thank you. A uh, fan of your work. And so uh, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to start off, uh, for those people who are unfamiliar with your work, uh, just sharing a few pieces of yours, uh, pieces that I selected off your site and a few other ones. Um, so I wanted to start with this one. And in particular, there's a reason for this. I love the title of this piece. Do you remember the title? I don't remember the title. Uh, now Voyager? Now Voyager. That's what I was thinking. So I, my first question to you is, uh, am I correct in thinking that that's a reference to the Betty Davis movie? It is a reference to the Betty Davis movie, yes. And is that because uh, it's, is it made with cosmetics? No, this one is enamel on aluminum. And uh, yeah, it's all, it's it's not made with cosmetics. Okay, because I, I think I, I've seen some works of yours before that where you did that. So that's yes, why I was just curious. I have. So what's the connection to the movie? It was just really a kind of intuitive response that I had to the, to the painting. And I sort of carry in my mind uh, the film titles that have been very meaningful to me as a uh, gay artist. Um, you know, Betty, Betty Davis is always some kind of melodrama happening happening in her in her films and um not that i find a sense of melodrama here but maybe a sense of of um drama mm -hmm. uh innate to the colors and the surface that's created i'm a big um, fan it's of that very movie slick it's a very slick, reflective surface. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, that it reflects in the movie when Betty Davis goes to that transformation and she becomes very slick. So that's right. Of that's course, how, that's how I was seeing it. And that's here we have another scene. piece. This this is also in the same vein as as the other one. But these are these are quite large, aren't they? They are uh, large. They're about. Um, 60 by 60, I believe. Okay. I would love to see this in person. It must be quite... Because it still has that enamel shine to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does have that enamel shine to it. Okay, he's cool. um, I had a the chance to have a... Uh, what they were calling a residency at Girard College, where I was able to use this big empty gym to make work in and I decided to make some very large enamel paintings uh, in that given that chance uh, and the and the size of the room I had no uh, I could never have done this in my studio my studio is just too small you you buying enamels in like gallon buckets <laughs> I am buying it by the gallon, yeah. <laughs> so this one is a little bit different. And yes. I had several sculptures to choose from, but, but this one just sort of worked for me, not only in the geometry of it, but um, just all the pieces together. So this is, where does this fit in your OVR? Is this an earlier piece? Um, it's actually, it was actually done after hmm. the enamel pieces. Um, I'm not quite sure of the year, uh, but I was very interested in um, just the sort of idea of sculpture and sculpture historically through the ages. And um, so I have uh, Venus down below. And then uh, what was actually a Kleenex box, a lacquered Kleenex box, hmm. uh, sitting on her shoulders. And so there's, and the sponge is an art historical reference to um, 
But an Ives oh, Klein? Yes, E. Klein. Mm -hmm. And then the Indian kind of figure up above uh, to add a kind of cultural reference to the piece. So uh, I feel like it came together well. I was happy. I was very happy with this piece. Did it come together pretty quickly? It looked like it, it was all yeah. the pieces look perfect. Like it, it, they kind of like they go together. Yeah, it did come together quickly. You're right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean it looks quick. It just means that the, to me, it looks like, well, of course, this piece goes here. You know, <laughs> it's right. Like, it's, right. A, it's a Thank logical you. kind of a thing, not a not a not a speed issue. Um, then we have something that's uh, a little bit newer. I believe they're newer. It is. So is this, tell me what I'm looking at. Is this a panel? Is it a print? Is it a? It's a print. Okay. So um, they're digitally put together? They're digitally put together. Okay. Um, I splice together these, um, the imagery that you see, uh, orchids on the left. Um, the source of this, body of work was actually uh, Boucher mm -hmm. and the sliver next to the uh, orchids and the uh, Gerhard Richter sl sliver on the right mm -hmm. um, in the middle is a reference to Boucher's um, mm -hmm. Diana after the hunt. I love his work. I do too. I really love, I love his work. And the far right is a, um, a fractal Mandelbrot. Okay. Um, or there's another word. What, what was the word you used? Fractal. Fractal. Yeah. Um, and I just loved the abstraction of the huh. fractal uh, and the colors. I mean, as soon as I saw that fractal part, I, I started thinking about the math that's involved within nature and even the math in uh, Boucher's work. So it, that's where my mind goes. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I like to hear that. And then you have another piece. Yeah, so here we have orchids again. Is that Frank um, It's a, a, no, it's a Boucher painting. Oh, is it? Well. Okay. All right. I don't, I don't know that one. Um, it's, uh, I believe it's titled Spring. And uh, covering their faces is a um, painting by, um, British painter, uh, Bridget Riley. Oh, right. Okay. And then a, a slice or splice of uh, Pollock. Uh, Pollock. And then a continuation of the Boucher painting on the far right. Are these, so the, you said these are prints. What size do they, are these printed out? They're printed out, uh, I believe they are are 17 by 20. Okay, so they're manageable sizes. Yeah. And do you do you addition? Size. Are they addition? There's an addition of five. Okay. All right. That's good to know. And then uh this was the final piece. This is on the, the homepage of your website. So this one is it's just fun for me. I mean I really right. I, I, and it's a little hard to see in the photograph, but I can tell that that's a three-dimensional object, correct? It is. The cake yeah. is, is three-dimensional. And uh, I collaborated with a woman who, uh, in Philadelphia, who made fake cakes. Okay. Um, and was really interested in my project and worked with the colors in the painting to inform the colors in the, in the cake. Um, so I have it's titled key. "Have Your Cake and Eat It Too." Nice. I saw. And... I got a geeky technical question for you. Oh, of course. It, was this shot downward, or was it, is it a digital 
piece that's put together? How do you get this image? The image itself, uh, I found. I mean, I I think I I just googled the image. Right, but did did you did you actually print it out and then put the cake on top and shoot yes. down? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. how it was done. Just a and just a weird tech question. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's fine. That's good. Um, I think that the interesting thing is that the story goes so the uh, young man at the bottom left is uh, has his hand sort of pointed to her mm -hmm. and supposedly is pointing to her vagina mm -hmm. and there is this uh, kind of sexual innuendo going on between the two. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I like the story. Nonetheless. <laughs> that's, that's what so, I, I see it as. I mean, look at that smile yeah, on her. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and he's very happy too. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. So um wanted to start out. I, I always start in these uh, conversations with the same question. So, uh, I, 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 I'm just going to let it fly. Um, okay. What was your first exposure to art? Do you remember as a, maybe a young child or whatnot, the first sort of thunderclap? Well, I remember my parents taking me to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, it was a show of the work of... Um, I'll go, I'll go blank. He makes big baked potatoes and... Oh, Oldenburg? Oldenburg. It was the show of Oldenburg. And as a kid, I was just really excited by that work. And these, I remember the the, the uh, baked potatoes zipped open or closed. And then there were these big, I guess, plastic pats of butter on top of uh -huh. it. And... Uh, the work just really spoke to me and excited me. Um, as a young child, I I don't know whether it was before or after or during, I took painting classes at the Philadelphia Museum of Art with uh, uh, okay. uh, the painter, the teacher was Itzik Zankowski, who was a painter himself. Uh -huh. And so my parents uh, really should be given the credit for exposing me to the this to art and artworks and mm. and uh, you know it's just a it's just a great way to grow up. So, at uh, what point did you decide that you were going to become an artist? I mean, you were taking art classes, but was there a day like you know what this is? This is for me. Well, I studied all through, I was an art major in high school. And then um, when it came to, I remember my father took me to Pratt uh, for an interview and I got into Pratt, but I really wasn't ready to go to college and to be in New York. Um, there were too many distractions and uh, left left Pratt before the initial semester ended, uh, went back home and was urged by my parents to select another um, another way of another kind of, uh, to move away from being an art major uh, and be a business major. Mm -hmm. uh, How'd that go over? <laughs> that didn't go over well, but I did <laughs> major in design and merchandising at Drexel in college. Okay. And so I still had a kind of, you know, art practice to continue with and i was a bit older which helped me a bit older than the other students which helped me i think 
in that I was more focused about what I wanted to do. Um, so how did you then slide after you graduated? Did it, was it a slow slide to becoming a visual artist or? It was a slow slide. I, I realized that I needed a master's and I mistakenly went, it was the last year it was Philadelphia College of Art mm. before it changed to University of the Arts. And I majored, I took a Master of Arts in Art Education. Mm. But I was not interested in teaching in high school or grade school. So I didn't go for certification. Mm. And uh, it was kind of a useless degree in some ways for me. Mm -hmm. um, I then realized that and went to Tyler for Master of Fine Arts in Sculpture. Mm. And that really uh, put myself back to where I wanted to be. Mm. It was a great that, experience. That's interesting because I didn't know that and it kind of gives me a little insight onto the sculptural elements in your work. Uh, you know, because sometimes right. people slide into that, but you were actually studying sculpture. And yes. Then now you combine the, the two. I, I want to talk a little bit about your creative process. So I'm I'm curious to know when you're in your studio, um, do your ideas do you do you have like fleshed out ideas in your mind first, or is it uh, play that creates your imagery, or is it kind of a combination of both? How how does that work for you? It's kind of a combination of both. I gather uh, objects uh, together in the studio and then so that it, there is a sense of play and trial and effort in putting these objects together. Um, so, uh, and then sometimes it's just that I know what what belongs together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would say more often it's a kind of uh, play that I have in the studio, which is which is great fun. I, I often artists who do that with with play, uh, sometimes the works come together. We talked about quickly. Sometimes the works, the ideas come together quickly. But sometimes right. I know for me, sometimes it's just fail after fail and eventually i just gotta walk away does that happen to you too i mean do you yeah of course of okay. course it does yeah do you ever and... like destroy works or do you always like i'm gonna keep working on this until something comes out of it? i i tend to keep the uh works hmm. keep them with the idea yes that i'll work on it and i'll try and you know get it to work and uh, often it just doesn't happen. Hmm. But does I it, keep the remnants of those works in the studio. Does that mean that those remnants then might get reworked months or years later? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they okay. do. I, I, I have quite a selection of objects, <laughs> imagery that, uh, you know, it, I like putting things together in the prints it's more about splicing imagery mm -hmm. and uh in the sculptures it's certainly more about building imagery so when i was younger i used to and fail a lot on one piece i always was convinced oh, this canvas is haunted so i just have to get rid of it it's never gonna work <laughs> of course you know now i like i'm frugal so i will definitely redo it um so one of the questions I had for you is kind of specific. When you reference art history in your works, say, right. say pieces or other, I'm curious, are you trying to reference their stories and then carry their stories of that work within your work? Or do you see it more as just an aesthetic reason to use those? Well, artists? it's something, uh, I mean, it's, it's an aesthetic reason but it's very specific, you know, and so it's kind of a combination of those two things happening. Um, 
because the works that you're you, you're selecting are so loaded with storyline right that i just see that carrying in and then it makes me wonder like well if i take that story plus what you've added to it you know other art history then i right. i'm creating something new here so i'm, I'm just kind of curious how much in depth is there with that uh but apparently there's a lot <laughs> there is a lot and there's a lot of you know, in the titles, I refer to film and the way that I talk about these prints and splicing imagery together is is another reference to film. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I try for um, meaning in those selections that I make, but sometimes it is sometimes it is just an aesthetic choice um the abstraction versus the um figurative and um you know that that becomes very specific sometimes in the work you you um, mentioned film have, have you ever have you ever done film have you ever no i i never had okay. my brother was a my oldest brother was a uh, a film person for a while he's since become a doctor and uh made his own films and i was very lucky there used to be in germantown a uh movie theater called the bandbox and he would take me to see Bunuel films and warhol films and hmm all these sort of underground films or the or films that at the time were considered underground. And I think that that really informed me as well and informs the choices I made. Oh, I definitely can see that. This is great because I'm, I'm learning all kinds of new stuff. Now I'm going to have to look at your work in a different way. So one of the things I see is based on the way you have your site set up is you have series of works that you do. Right. So, uh, curious to know, do those do those series ever overlap? Do you like definitely have a start and a stop to them, or do you revisit them later on? I that's a that's a good question. I there is a kind of stop and start, stop and or start and stop. Um, but even with the prints, I had thoughts especially with the cake print, which does have the three-dimensional element to it. Initially, when I went to make the, 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 the series of prints, uh, I thought that I was going to be attaching objects to the surface, like I did with the Fragonard. Um, but that didn't really work out and so i sort of gave that up but for for that body of work but i haven't given it up mm. uh entirely mm. in fact the 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 work that i'm doing now uh i'm thinking about incorporating neon um i'm having tapestries woven mm. And I'm thinking about incorporating neon into the tapestry in some weird way that I haven't figured out technically. I look forward to seeing it. Is that a new series then? That's a new it... series, yeah. Okay, all right. So I have to ask this question. Sure. Because one of the things that um, I've always uh, been attracted to your work by is color. Right. Um, so su super simple question. Talk to me about color. What do you think about color like when well i'm colorblind really you're the second yeah. artist this week that i've worked with. really yeah <laughs> okay so what does but that mean? i love but but i love and i embrace color okay and so i the the best way i've come to talk about it for someone to understand is that i see color the way i see color Mm -hmm. I mean, I see color. People think you only see in shades of gray and black and white. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, I have the most difficulty uh, uh, with blue and purple. 
mm -hmm. and green and brown. Mm. I, I mistake those two very easily. That's interesting because um, your work is so color saturated. A lot of the yeah, time. yeah, yeah, it is, and and it's an it attests to my love of color and and just going forward with it and sort of forgetting the fact and not letting it hinder me that I'm colorblind. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Now, mm -hmm. more <laughs> more things to go back and take a look at your work. Uh, do you do you look at other artists' work? like as for inspiration or just as comfort or I do look at other artists work I, I mean I have certain works by artists that I'm very particularly connected feel con a connection with they might not look like my work in any way I mean Lucio Fontana I love Lucio Fontana's work mm. and um Gerhard Richter's work, mm -hmm. I love Pollock. I mean, I could go on and on. I mm -hmm. mean, and they're and they're in the prints. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of not only it, does it serve do do these does the imagery of these artists serve the print, but it's an homage to those artists that I feel a connection to. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I can see where you're lifting and kind of celebrating sometimes or just making a nod to these different artists. Right, and exactly. I like that. It's, an, it's interesting. Uh, so I, I've got uh, time for one final question. Okay. Question I ask everybody. Simple question. What does making art do for you? Oh, it... Um... It charges me. Um, it does many things. I mean, it, it. I love the feeling of being in the studio working on my work, and I'm not feeling any pain in my body. I'm just so committed to the work that it relieves me of whether it's anxiety or whether it's sexual pain, I have back problems and uh, I don't have to go into that, but. Um, so it sounds like it's an out of body experience almost. Yeah. It feels like an out of body experience. And I just love that. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to find that outside of the studio for me. Yeah. Um, so. So that's. That would that's it in a nutshell. Did I that's, answer that question? That's, yeah, that's the main, main driver. I mean, okay. <laughs> I just love that. Well, Stuart, uh, now I have to go back and, and re-examine your work now that we've talked, because now I have new new things to think about when I'm looking at your work. I do, I do want to thank you very much for coming by today. Oh, I really you, appreciate you, you taking the time. I want to thank everybody who tuned in today to uh, watch Stuart uh, talk about his work and for uh, watching Art Show. Uh, we do encourage you, obviously, to like and subscribe. Subscribing helps us uh, keep going with this kind of thing. And again, Stuart, thank you very much. Uh, for oh, your thank you, Craig. Really appreciate it. I enjoyed I'll it. See, I'll see you next time on our show. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.